Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I think for the Australian comrade, it's already good night, good evening. We have very different time zones I'm in Argentina, but there are comrades who are even earlier, which are the Central American comrades. But we will begin this panel. Our idea is for the comrades that will intervene in this panel, which will be Comrade Oleg, Comrade Yegor, and Anek, that we will open their audios when it's their turn to speak. And the rest of the comrades can intervene through the chat that is open. Because of this Zoom system, which is a free one, which uh, has replaced the paid ones for us, it allows for different channels, but it's a bit more complex in how the audios are managed. So we're, we're trying this one for the first time, so we're hoping everything goes well. So we'll begin this panel that we have called a militarization of the environment and the struggle for hegemony, the war in Ukraine, struggle for hegemony and nuclear threat in World War III. I'm going to be more coordinating than a panelist. So just a couple of words, the social environmental destruction we are witnessing is deeply related to this imperialist phase of imperialism, of capitalism. So we can only resolve it, leaving capitalism behind and moving towards a different system, which for us is socialism to resolve the problems of humanity. That's why our model has nothing to do with the model of supposed so-called real socialism which was actually a negation of socialism under Stalinism. Now we are witnessing a struggle for hegemony that we are essentially seeing between the United States and China, though behind the United States there is a bloc, and on China's side there are also others, Russia or Iran. Now that struggle between a an imperialist power in decadence and a rising imperialist power will have a very high cost. We will see many aspects of this struggle, but in in environmental plane, in the to the extent that this struggle for hegemony advances, we're going to see more environmental disaster. It's cold here, so many of us have, have colds. <laughs> the United States in trying to struggle with China is giving free road to all the corporations and that China has a advance what it has advanced it has also done it done this uh, opening ways towards extractivism and environmental destruction this opens another debate which is over whether either of these are progressive at all and neither of these blocks are progressive at all they have nothing that is progressive their capitalism and environmental destruction is just as bad. And since it's impossible to pass power from one superpower to another without a struggle, so the possibility of a military confrontation between these two blocs, the United States and China, is a possibility that is on the table, which if it took place, would have a catastrophic 
uh, consequences, not just in human lives and in the economic destruction of countries, but also the possibility of nuclear war, which would put human life in, in question and the environmental costs of chemical weapons, nuclear weapons would also be tremendous. That's why those of us who struggle for a different system We have to know that the environmental struggle <laughs> has to take up this uh, challenge of what the inter-imperialist struggle will bring to the environment in these strategies of the different imperialist powers. We're seeing even in currently the um, war in Ukraine, which has already have tremendous consequences. Is everything, can you hear everything okay? Of course, the Ukrainian comrades will tell us more about this, of course, and better than I can. But we have to know that the war, in addition to tens of thousands of deaths and not just of the belligerent forces but of the civil population it has also had a high environmental cost they've uh, destroyed dams they've contaminated rivers ecosystems have been destroyed the, the environmental cost has been tremendous and some consequences will take decades or centuries to to fix and some of the most important uh, nuclear power plants in europe uh, are in danger and because the war continues and since they don't care at all about uh, anything that has to do with life or nature what's behind this fratricidal war could could end up in a nuclear disaster much bigger, which would not just affect Ukraine, but all of Europe. It's important to know that the cost of all of this is very high. That's why we think that the struggle for Russia to leave Ukraine and to stop trying to submit the Ukrainian people is closely linked to the struggle against the consequences of war for humanity, which will not also affect Ukraine and the parts of Belarus or Russia that are implied, but it can have consequences that can go farther. It's important to link these struggles, link the struggle against the war in Ukraine to the environmental struggle as well. So to confronting the attempts of imperialism to lead us towards a global destruction, which would have no positive outcome possible because there is no progressive side in that struggle because that war can end in a catastrophe, an atomic catastrophe could end. So I think it's very important that the unity of the, the environmental struggle <laughs> and the struggle for the liberation of the working class and the peoples that tie us to imperialism and to end capitalism and to build a different future. So this forum is at the service of debating different issues, but also for organizing for that objective. 
It's for the environmental struggles, but also for a broader struggle of transforming life into not the suffering that capitalism imposes, but in the barbarism they want to sink us in. So that's why this these forums, it's important that they have the perspective of going beyond the specific issue and organizing to struggle for a global change, which for us is towards socialism in a world where we can not only end with, put an end to oppression and exploitation, but also to put an end to environmental destruction, destruction that the corporations carry out today that destroy this world today. And since we don't have another planet, this is the only one we have to defend. So with these brief uh, words, I will open the panel. So first, uh, Oleg Vernik will, will speak. He is a political and un trade union leader in Ukraine. Um, veteran trade union leader and uh, also the leader of the Ukrainian Socialist League. So I um, welcome the comrade Oleg to speak. We have to open his audio. So uh, you want to speak? hear him in Russian, you can do that in the Russian channel or in the English or Spanish channels to hear the translations. Uh, friends, it's a pleasure for me to take part in this forum in this event. I must say that we are in the day 500 of this war of the this aggression of the Russian Federation against Ukraine. The socialists of Ukraine and of the world have new challenges today. The fatal victims, the destruction of civil infrastructure, the ecological catastrophes, this has had many tragic consequences. We can observe this over a long period of time. And all of this modifies the anti-imperialist language discourse. However, all of these elements that have to do with the catastrophe in the Kahu Dam in the Southern Ukraine and the hydroelectric plant on June 6th of this year has divided this war in two parts notoriously. The first part is the war before that catastrophe, before that ecological catastrophe. And the second part of the war is how we will face this war and experience this war after this disaster took place is a consequence of the this destruction of dams in southern Ukraine. 14 localities were flooded with a population of 16,000 people in the right bank of the Dnipro. 
While on the left bank, there is another 14 localities that have a population of 22,000. And that site is occupied by Russian translator today. Tens of thousands of wild and domestic animals died. Tons of fish eh, died as well. For decades, decades, for for decades towards the future, Ukraine will have a devastated landscape where there was fertile ground before. In lands that were irrigated by the Dnieper River. According to the agriculture ministry, because of the bombing of the hydroelectric plant, there is 500,000 hectares that will not be a cultivatable in the future. Before the Russian invasion, that area a, produced up to 4 million tons of grains. and a millions of US dollars, representing millions of dollars. For us, it's an absolute truth that capitalism, because of its nature, is anti-ecological. It is a manner of administering natural resources And only the level of profits determines its relation with natural resources. There's a few capitalist countries that consider themselves the billion dollar golden countries that can carry out some programs dedicated to protecting the environment and each of those activities is related to a ferocious struggle against the environmentalist activists that fight against the insatiable appetite of the bourgeoisie This bourgeoisie is fighting against the working class, but also, but is also damaging the environment. It's a complete madness. That we see on the part of capitalist governments. But that is the logic of the development of imperialist capitalism. The imperialist war has been the continuation of imperialist poli politics of this world. During the war, the imperialist bourgeoisie shows its true face, their facade of protectors of the environment falls, and we see their true face in its primitive form, and it's 
aggressive character. We see the possibility of a even higher catastrophe with the possibility of a nuclear a catastrophe with an incident in the nuclear power plant in southern Ukraine, which is another resource Russian imperialism has to blackmail other countries' uh, governments in a way. We are convinced that society has to turn towards the struggle for the defense of the environment. And we have to fight for the principles of democratic socialism and the protection of the environment around the world. Only an eco-socialist policy across the world can give humanity a chance to save civilization from a worldwide catastrophe. The only thing uh, else I have to say is forward towards socialism, advance towards a ecological society in the future. With pleasure, I can give over the floor to my comrade of the Ukrainian Socialist League, to my comrade Igor. Thanks for your attention. One second, Igor. Just one moment, because there's some comrades that are having problems with the translation, connecting to the Spanish translation. <laughs> the two ways to activate it. And it could be in uh, telephone, you have to look for the three dots to find the interpretation options. Or could be a problem with your device. Because we have two or three comrades asking, but most everyone else is hearing the Spanish translation fine. So I ask you to try to resolve it there. And we'll open the floor to Yegor, who will speak in Russian or Ukrainian, and we will translate. It's been over a month since they bombed the Hersov a hydroelectrical plant. There have been no guarantees of access or security there. The UN hasn't had access to that area. They haven't had security access to uh, aid people in that zone. As always, the price of these uh, aggressions by Russian imperialism are paid by the common people. There's a huge area that has been flooded and damaged that has destroyed the area's ecosystem. The environment minister of Ukraine says that 300 tons 
of lubricant and oils have been spilled in the in the river and this becomes an ecocide the damaged environments represent parks ecological reserves that were created specifically to try to preserve that ecosystem we know that the nuclear plant of Saparija depended from that depended heavily on that dam in ukraine each of us knows what the consequences of a nuclear accident can imply my grandfather is one of the people who helped a people in the chernobyl incident he has had many health issues because of that and so the possibility of a nuclear accident today is being used by russia to blackmail we know that india and pakistan two countries that also have nuclear weapons also have access to very important water waterways that is, is very important and the catastrophe that has that can be produced in the future can have drastic consequences for humanity we know the russian and ukrainian oligarchs don't care about what is happening in the ukrainian territory and the area has been bombed and destroyed that u.s general has said in foreign affairs that this war has had consequences that can be measured in billions of dollars and this affects the big cities we know that russia is firm on this and putin is a an oligarch and an oppressor and we know he doesn't care if there are thousands of people suffering because of that catastrophe so that's how things are today we thank you very much for your attention thank you comrade now a uh, comrade anek from australia will will speak for us hola compañeros um thanks for having me um and yeah as the comrades from ukraine have um talked about the sort of drive to war obviously will have profound impacts um on the environment and on human life um everywhere um but i want to talk a bit about australian um imperialism um, and the AUKUS uh, agreement that's been signed between Australia, the United States and the United um, Kingdom government um, and sort of talk about the impacts um, that this is going to have. Uh, yeah. So for decades, America has been the global hegemon. But with the rise of China, uh, the impacts of the Russian invasion of the Ukraine and the like, imperialist tensions are escalating. And governments the world over are increasing their military budgets, shoring up access to natural resources, and the threat of a coming global conflict looms over us. I'd like to focus on the AUKUS agreement, nuclear submarines, and the resistance to uranium and nuclear power in Australia's past, and think about what lessons the left can draw from them. The US, uh, UK and Australian governments came together with the AUKUS agreement, which firmly puts Australia in the camp of US imperialism against the rising tide of China. The AUKUS deal will see Australia acquire nuclear powered submarines and US submarines will rotate through Australian ports. 
This is an escalation of the drive to war and a real threat to peace and the working class in the region. There's a lot for us to be concerned about with this deal. There's the military buildup that is going on. The fact that this takes us closer down the path to war with China. The environmental impacts of nuclear waste. The potential of nuclear powered industries finding a foothold in Australia and the threat, the threat to the working class in Australia and in the broader region. So I wanna deal with these um, issues individually and close with some remarks about the historical resistance to Australia, in Australia, uh, to uranium mining, nuclear power and nuclear weapons. Firstly, it's important to note that the extent to which there is opposition to AUKUS it's around the fact that the government is spending close to $400 billion on the deal, which equates to $28 million a day for the next 30 years. This announcement took place in the context of the worst cost of living crisis in decades in Australia. Uh, the cost of housing and basic goods has increased massively. Uh, the government um, has also announced a $300 billion tax cut for the wealthy. So people are passed off, pissed off at the lack of action on housing, um, the rising prices and the fact that wages haven't gone up and the fact that the state, state is spending so much money on submarines and tax break, breaks for the rich. The idea of a war with China is pretty far from the popular, popular imagination, despite the fact the mainstream media has been going on an offensive to paint the Chinese state as a imminent threat to the Australian people. This means that very little of the public opposition to AUKUS is framed in terms of it being part of an imperialist drive. The deal does have uh, you know, majority support, but there's a substantial minority that opposes the submarine deal. And it's also provoked division in the ruling Labor Party. A former prime minister lashed out publicly against the deal. There's local labour branches that have moved anti-AUKUS motions. And some of the unions with left traditions have criticised it. But this is all very shallow. There's no real fight inside the ruling Labour Party to break the party from the US alliance um, and the increasing militarisation. The reality is, though, this is an escalation of Australia's imperialist ambitions, and it's a build-up of the military. Earlier this year, the government announced the Defence Strategic Review, which named China as the key threat to the global rules-based order. It strengthened its relationship with the US and is seeking stronger alliances with Pacific nations, Japan and ASEAN, basically everyone but China. The idea that China is the main threat in the region is obviously ludicrous. America is the largest imperial power with mi military bases throughout the region. Uh, it's jealously guarding Taiwan and the semiconductor plants. Plus, Australia has been constantly extending their interests in the region, laying claim over natural resources and spying on the Indonesian government. Australia has increased its military spending to about $70 billion a year, and there's already been $2 billion spent on military infrastructure upgrades um, uh, with the United States, and there'll be a permanent rotation of 2,500 US Marines. The government's also purchased new fighter jets. And the AUKUS agreement will see American submarines stationed in Australian ports, which will see submarines potentially loaded with nuclear weapons on our shores. And the north of Australia is being turned into a beachhead for US imperialism in Southeast Asia. Um, and all of this is just the beginning. And the Northern Territory capital um, will become a major military target in the event of a US war. The submarines that the government is purchasing are long range submarines, meaning they'll have the capability of striking Chinese naval forces. This can only be seen as a threat by the Chinese state and this takes us closer to war. 
The line from the mainstream is that we need this alliance and the submarines in order to defend Australia from the military threat of China. In reality, if Australia was not allied with the United States, there'd be no reason for China to bother with Australia. But if Australia is home to nuclear submarines, American bombers and soldiers, many targets are created. So that's the second key point. The Australian government has taken the choice of firmly joining the US war camp, and this takes us closer down the path of war. The third key point is this could see nuclear power and weapons coming into Australia. Despite Australia not being one of the nuclear armed powers and a signatory to the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. By getting nuclear-powered submarine technology from the United States, Australia is exploiting a loophole in the existing treaties. And this could lead to copycat behaviour by other states, meaning that more weapons-grade uranium will be floating around. And this means that more states will be much closer to being able to gain access to enriched uranium which means they'll be far closer to having access to nuclear weapons. Once a nuclear industry is set up to facilitate these submarines, it's much easier to make the argument that Australia should enrich uranium here. Already, the opposition Liberal Party is making the argument that nuclear power should be set up in the country. This is a dangerous line of argument. Australian people have long resisted both uranium mining, nuclear power and weapons, which I'll get into later, but it's a problem that this resistance is being forgotten and that this industry could now be introduced to the country. The nuclear um, reactors required to power the submarines use 95% enriched uranium, which requires 100,000 years of isolation. It's just almost an inconceivable amount of time. Australia is already struggling to deal with low weighed, uh, a low grade nuclear waste derived from nuclear um, medical facilities. And I think that nuclear waste poses a real threat to humans and the broader ecosystem. It causes pollution, plant and animal uh, death, cancers, and potentially uh, early deaths for people who come into contact with it. And there's currently no plan to deal with the nuclear waste associated with the submarines. Our Defence Minister, Richard Miles, has said that it will be stored on defence land, which means it'll be stored on Indigenous land. And the international ruling class has a terrible track record in dealing with dangerous materials. The UK government currently has um, uh, submarine graveyards where nuclear-powered submarines that have passed their use-by date are stationed, and they haven't figured out a long-term storage solution. So this is not promising for Australia's future storage of dangerous nuclear waste. Put together, this all creates serious problems for the Australian, Chinese and international working class. We're on a drive to war which will see nuclear armed powers come up against one another. Workers will be forced to fight wars um, uh, that uh, in the service of their rulers. Short of a full imperial confrontation, nuclear waste will threaten the environment and the lives of people in Australia. Once these powers do confront one another, a nuclear war is a real possibility. As long as nuclear weapons exist, as long as they are in the hands of rulers concerned with holding only onto their power and expanding their power, the possibility of a nuclear war cannot be ruled out. Before I end, I'd like to talk about the movements in Australia's past against uranium and nuclear. Australia still has a strong public sentiment um, against nuclear power waste and uranium mining. This is due to the powerful movements that have taken place in our past. And I want to focus on two moments. The campaign against the Jabaluka uranium mine and the movement against uranium mining centred in Brisbane. The campaign against Jabaluka kicked off in the 90s after the John Howard Liberal government announced the approval of uranium mining in Kakadu, Indigenous land in the Northern Territory. 
In the late 90s, a broad-based community campaign kicked off. Centred at the mining site, they had big blockades um, against the mine that was being proposed to be built, um, where activists and students and workers in their hundreds and in their thousands um, blocked um, mining uh, material coming in. And also in the cities, with supporters of the Indigenous people organising protests and blockades of North Limited, which was the company um, that was going to be responsible for the mine. And this company um, was like really greatly affected by these protests. It lost um, uh, hundreds of millions of dollars um, in its valuation. And thousands of people were part of the blockade in the um, north and protests in the cities. And they successfully stopped the building of this mine. The second campaign to spotlight is the campaign against uranium mining in Queensland in the 1970s. This movement was spearheaded by unionists who refused to work on uranium mines until the issue of nuclear waste was dealt with. And it was kicked off by a railway worker who refused to load material that was being sent to a mine site because his union had adopted a policy um, of uh, banning any material um, to do with uranium mining. He was fired. And in response to that, there was a nationwide railway strike. And this is now for acknowledged as the first strike anywhere in the world um, against um, nuclear. And the movement included strikes of other industries and developed into a broad-based uh, civil rights campaign because the government um, banned street protests in Brisbane. Students, unionists and community members participated in mass uh, uh, demonstrations that defied the ban on, on, on protests. They visited workplace, workplaces and stop work meetings, uh, talking about the dangers of uranium mining and how uranium mining in Australia gets us closer to nuclear power and nuclear weapons. Sandra Bloodworth, an Australian socialist and a participant in the movement wrote, we didn't stop uranium mining, but we delayed it. And we created a wide awareness amongst workers and the general public about the dangers of the industry. This legacy still continues today, but it's waning. There's not enough resistance from the unions and against nuclear um, and uranium or against the AUKUS deal. And it's the Labor government purportedly elected to represent working class people, which is in power here now, um, that is strengthening imperialist ties with the United States. In order to stop AUKUS, stop further uranium mining and stop the drive to war, we will need to revive these traditions. Socialist Alternative is organising everywhere we can. Our students are organising a nationwide protest in August against AUKUS and arguing for spending on welfare and housing instead. This is a starting point, but we will need more um, in order to stop a coming imperialist slaughter and the destruction of the environment around us. We need an international movement of workers and the youth to respond to the intersecting crises of capitalism that are shaping the world today. Rising imperialist tensions are the sharpest edge of the capitalist onslaught that we are fighting against. Thanks, comrades. Thank you, comrade. We have the chat open. So if for people, you want to ask the panelists questions, there have been some interventions, but if anyone wants to ask questions there, if not, we can move towards a few final words from each of the panelists. The forum is scheduled to end in about an hour, so we're still responding to some comrades who are struggling with the translators. 
If you're on a computer, there's a logo at the bottom. Or if you're on a phone, you have to find the, th the three dots. Desde Impulso Socialista de Colombia, su compañera Ángela está escribiendo una pregunta para los panelistas, pero no aparece todavía la pregunta. No aparece. ¿No? ¿Cómo? Bueno, mientras van uh, haciendo algunas preguntas, yo. Eh, okay, so as they um, we receive some questions, we can open the floor to Oleg for some final reflections. There's a question for all the panelists in el perdón estoy yo en el marco de la guerra in the context of the war a question for the panelists what debates and proposals do organized workers have in the resistance in relation to the environmental destruction. I understand it's linked to the war in Ukraine. Bueno, Oleg, ¿querés eh, hacer uso de, de tus minutos un poco finales con una reflexión Oleg, final? Oleg, do you want to say some Final words, some closing statements. Here's another question. No, no. Now we're getting some questions. From Argentina. About the nuclear submarines. The submarines have nuclear reactors that power them. If they have an accident, could they uh, spill nuclear uh, debris or waste uh, in the ocean? So it's a question for the Australian comrade. Another question from from Mexico to the Ukrainian comrades. And he wasn't able to listen to the entire, but what is the perspective of the conflict? Another question from Argentina for all the panelists. Eh, desde Córdoba, que es una provincia de Argentina. Si pueden From Córdoba, en Argentina. If you can specify a proposal for replacing nuclear energy. Because one thing they criticize us is that socialists criticize nuclear energy, but don't propose a replacement. What could be, in this critical situation, what could be the main transitional measures from nuclear power to in the coming period? Thank 
ਫਿਰ ਉਤਰਾ ਉਤਰਾ ਪ੍ਰੋਂਤਾ ਇਸ ਏ ਸੀ ਐਲ ਰੈਸਟੋ ਦੇ ਲਾ ਕੋਰੀਅੰਟਸ ਦੀ ਇਸਕਿਰਦਾ ਅਨਦਰ ਕੁਐਸਚਨ ਇਸ ਦਾ ਅਦਰ competing left wing currents have a response to the environmental question is it all of the left that has a response to the environmental issue or a or just us or other other tendencies on the left bueno compañeros si les parece bien iríamos ya a la Okay, comrades, we all. Otro compañero, están muchas relacionados con lo mismo, que es con el tema nuclear. La posición sobre la fusión nuclear. Few questions have to do with the same thing about nuclear power, position on nuclear fusion. Things have to do with the. ¿Qué hacer con la energía nuclear? ¿Qué haría con los socialistas? Polemic. What would socialists do with nuclear energy? could we quickly replace it or how in which way yeah i'm waiting if there's a see if there's a couple more questions then we'll move forward obviously nuclear energy is not just used for nuclear weapons but also for medicine for it has different uses also that's why there's debates We have in Argentina we have comrades that are technicians and engineers that work in the nuclear power plants and so we have debates and polemics with them over what what to do with nuclear energy the, we have uh, the, the left has a a significant influence in among the workers of the nuclear power workers so otra pregunta que creo que es de un compañero que es de la Siberia que es un compañero de Perú another question desde hace muchos años comrade from Peru but who is in Siberia solar podrían reemplazar a la energía nuclear could a eolic energy or solar energy replace nuclear energy una para australia que con qué políticas concretas cree que se puede generar energía no contaminada or australia with what specific uh, policies do you think uh, can generate clean energy yo las leo nada más a la a la you know read them off we don't have to answer all of them necessarily but what do you think of the green or blue hydrogen and the management of impure waters el consumo de uranio para esos submarinos y bombas es significativo en comparación de mantener las plantas another question is is the amount of uranium used for those submarines is significant in comparison to a, what is used for the nuclear power plants that exist otra pregunta cómo cómo se podría apaciguar la escalada militar y por ende los how can the a military escalation be mitigated or stopped and its environmental consequences so we can stop there and move to the panelists and see how they can take up the answers so we'll begin with begin with oleg do you want to begin oleg Коллеги, огромное спасибо 
за ваши очень глубокие содержательные вопросы, которые были мне заданы и мне и моим Thank you for the important questions you've, you've made. Thank you for all that reflection. Some of your questions, I can't, I don't have a, a, an answer because I'm not a specialist on some of those issues. I don't have a scientific basis to give a developed a answer. But there's uh, some questions I do want to answer or share my thoughts on. Our comrade from Australia in her intervention said that in Australia, there is a mine that extracts uranium. and that there's uh, an entire movement in Australia to try to close that mine. That's a very important element to know about that, that this happens in our country. So you understand in Ukraine, there are 17 uranium mines in being exploited in Ukraine being exploited actively today in Ukraine. And there are 21 um, res uranium reserves that have been identified and are planned to be exploited in the future. I agree with the uh, thesis that uranium, with the thesis Alejandro was saying, that uranium has other uses, not not just you know, yeah, weapons, but also energy. Different countries with different uh, circumstances have have combined different sources of energy Your electric uh, nuclear some countries more thermal plants so there the gas is primordial resource germany for example other countries on the contrary have prioritized for many years now the nuclear policies to have nuclear-based energy. And defend the idea of nuclear power being predominant, like in France, for example. In Ukraine, many uh, nuclear stations have been built in Ukraine. And it's a very cheap resource. So that 
cheap energy has conditioned and it was an exportable material that became an important part of the Ukrainian economy. The energy that came from the nuclear plants has been exported to other countries for decades now. Obviously, the extraction of uranium demands huge uh, investments in from the payments and mine workers. There's a key point. The Zhoytevote is city in Ukraine, the center of the country, where one of the main uranium mines in the country is. Before the war, that city, before the war, our organization was very active in that city. We were working with the uh, mine workers of that uranium mine. The mine workers have been victim of many damages they've of the radiation and the big investors have never taken that into account. Truth is that the problem of the possible explosion of the Saporizhia in power plant is a very painful issue. If this were to happen, it would have catastrophic consequences on a large scale. Many times that nuclear plant is speculated on politically and around the war. The Ukrainian Secret Service is reporting that uh, Russian forces have mined the nuclear power plant at Zaporizhia. The Russian government, on the contrary, is trying to convince everyone that it is Ukraine, Ukraine and its troops that are planning a act of terrorism against the uh, in the facilities of the nuclear power plant of Zaporizhia. There's a terrible tendency in how the ecology has been a hostage of this war conflict. There was a very important question about the alternative sources of energy. What are the alternatives to that re resource?
I think there's two important aspects here. The first aspect has to do with in Western Europe. Parliaments, governments for a long time now have been sustaining with subsidies or tax breaks those nuclear plants. or supporting those nuclear power plants. So as a consequence, the biggest capitalist investors have been attracted to that source of energy, of nuclear energy. And so they've invested over many years We know that there are countries where there is more investment in aeolic power or solar power. So this green energy. Has become a resource that is property of a, a few oligarchs in our country. It's in private hands. So the solar energy is also supported by the oligarchs it is not supported by the government it is not doesn't have the tax breaks that nuclear energy has in spite of all this those oligarchs have are ma manipulating the energetic sector. So they are investing in alternative sources of energy only to to try to uh, gain a profit. But when I say that the nuclear plants in Ukraine are in the hands of the state, I can't not also say that the appetites of the oligarchs and the rulers of the country of Zelensky's regime, now those appetites are moving towards the privatization of the nuclear plants, something which we haven't seen in the past in our country. For example, surely you know that Ukraine is planning in the next few years to buy nuclear reactors, Russian-made reactors from Bulgaria. Bulgaria left half-finished their nuclear facility and they want to sell it to Ukraine now. 
And that's a lot of money in the Ukrainian government today as a consequence of this war doesn't have those resources. So they're offering Bulgaria to be co-owners of those nuclear plants that would be installed in Ukrainian territory. These plants that Ukraine would buy from Bulgaria. This would be a first step towards the privatization of nuclear energy in Ukraine. The following steps would be the complete privatization of nuclear energy. And Zelensky doesn't, he doesn't hide these plans of his government. In that context, in the Ukrainian Socialist League, we, we say we can't have environmental security in a country where there are forces of peripheral capitalism when the elements that threaten the ecology are in the hands of the oligarchs of the big capitalist investors. That's where the connections between our socialist politics and the defense of the environment have to be very linked. Our Australian comrade talked about sorry as we are being able to talk about now in our country about the defense of the environment in the working class to dis to defend the environment for now, we are a relatively small organization. We have existed for two years, and we are trying to expand, extend our ideas and use uh, social media and the web to get our ideas out to the other unions in our country. The union I'm a part of has a nucleus of activists We have a group of members of the union in one of the mines. They follow our ideas. They have our socialist ideas of the defense of the environment. We think that in the collective discussion, our ideas of the defense of the environment 
importante. Want this discussion to reach and be given in the working class so it can reach the entire region where those mines and power plants are. The result of these discussions, 18 members of our union were fired and we have a lawsuit being fought for for the to recover their jobs so you can see our organization is fighting in harsh conditions I have high hopes our my comrade Yegor can continue answering. Thanks, Oleg, and we'll give the floor to Yegor now. Thanks uh, very much for this meeting, this forum. I want to say a couple of things about the perspectives in our country. When the war broke out, no one talked about a, a Ukraine that could stand up to Russia, thought of a Ukraine that could fall in three days, but we are 500 days into this war and we ask ourselves what what will come after the war? In whose hands will our country's nuclear energy, gas, in whose hands will this be after the war? In some articles in the local press, that Ukraine will become an energy hub for the rest of Western Europe after the war. We have a, a, a joke that our country is a kind of big uh, a petrol station, gas station. When actually Russia is seen around the world as a big provider of nuclear energy and gas and petroleum. The question is who will have these resources in their hands after the war? Will it be the big international corporations like Chevron? Or what, what we would want is for those sources of energy to be in the hands of the working class. An organization like ours, the Ukrainian Socialist League, will fight for this to happen, for the working class to own the energy of our country. Okay, thanks, Yegor. And we'll give the floor to Anek. Thanks for the discussion. Um, one, 
One second. <laughs> One moment. Because <laughs> more comrades have joined and they're asking again to find the translation. If you're on a computer, at the bottom, there's an icon that looks like a world that says interpretation. You'll have the languages there. If you're on a cell phone, look for the three dots at the bottom and you'll find interpretation there and you'll find the languages there. We're translating to Russian, Spanish, and English. And in the next panels, we will also have Portuguese for some that have asked. We hadn't planned it for this one, but we'll have Portuguese translation in the next two panels where there will be uh, comrades from Brazil intervening there as well. Okay, now yes, Anek, uh, sorry. Go ahead, please. Thanks, comrade. Uh, well, thanks for the discussion. I think one thing to say is with the um, war on Ukraine, we saw a massive rush to gain access to other resources as the European Union looked to end its reliance on Russian gas. And that shows you, I think, the sort of connection between imperialist war and the further exploitation of the environment. As different countries, you know, seek to, um, you know, shore up uh, alliances and also shore up oppositional power blocks, that means looking for new resources to exploit uh, and so I think it's right to sort of think about the connection between war and the environment in that way. And as the climate crisis gets worse, um, access to those resources will become uh, an even bigger question. And with the melting of the Arctic sea ice, the up of sea lanes, um, in the north and also, you know, potential natural resources uh, under the ice. Like the scramble for those resources will become a, a bigger and bigger question. And, it, you know, America won't want to allow Russia or China to have access to those resources. So it's a, a pretty big question. Someone asked about the danger of nuclear submarines um, one way that it's sort of spoken about in Australia is thinking about these submarines as floating Hiroshima's. Um, they become potential, um, you know, sites of um, accidents. Um, we know there's lots of accidents in the um, military arena. Um, but I think the sort of the question that we're dealing with in Australia is definitely the, the question of the problem of the waste uh, that's associated with these um, nuclear submarines. So each of the reactors required to power the nuclear submarines, um, uh, they weigh over 100 tonnes and have 200 kilograms of the deadly enriched uranium. Um, but because Australia isn't a nuclear-powered country, I actually don't know how that compares to um, other nuclear um, reactors, which gets me to the point about nuclear power um, itself. People asked, well, what do we replace it with? In Australia, we don't have nuclear power plants. We don't power our energy grid with nuclear power. Um, it's powered by um, coal-fired power plants, um, gas plants, and then there's also a renewable power um, grid. Um, and the left in Australia has taken a strong stance against nuclear power um, because it takes us closer to having not just nuclear power but also nuclear weapons. And that has been, those two questions have been linked um, in the discussions in Australia's left and working class movements. Um, it's not divorced, they're seen uh, as connected. Um, and also because of the problems of the nuclear waste that's associated um, with nuclear um, powered plants. 
Um, and also because of the dangers of just problems happening in um, nuclear power plants as well. Um, you only have to think about Fukushima um, to realise the problems associated with that. Um, I think Japan is just about to um, release um, a new lot of the um, the like new, the radiated water associated with the nuclear power plants um, into the ocean, into the seas. Um, and I think, you know, that's a really dangerous, um, uh, you know, problem. Um, so we say we don't want any nuclear power in this country. Um, there have been unions in Australia that have also um, pushed that argument. So the Electrical Trades Union um, has a, so they're the union that deals with electrical work, like electricity workers and the like. Um, they've said that they won't um, support nuclear power in this country. So the live issue here is more one of the question of nuclear waste dumps. Um, the Indigenous people in South Australia have been protesting against a proposed nuclear waste dump on their land. And with the announcement of the, um, the AUKUS deal, the government has indicated that South Australia will be likely the place for nuclear waste. Um, and the just the like the way that they haven't really thought it through is seen with the way that the defense minister talks about the nuclear waste will be um on defense land. It's like you can't just have these deadly enriched uranium just sitting above ground. There's no um, real storage um, plan that they've actually created to deal with it. The other point is that Australia is a country with massive uranium deposits. It's one of the, you know, um, uh, it's it's got one of the most amounts of uranium deposits out of any country. The government wants to exploit that uranium. It wants to be able to gain access it access to it. It wants to be able to sell it to other countries and it wants to be able to use it um, to power um, submarines like this. Um, we don't want them to open up new uranium mines. Um, I, might, I may have made a confusion with my presentation. Um, the movements that I was talking about um, took place in the 1990s and the 1970s. Um, the the movement against the uranium mine and then the, the union movements that I talked about were in the 70s. But there's a movement against these things in its infancy um, at the early stages. And we want to revive the traditions against um, uranium mining and against nu uh, nuclear um, weapons. Um, and I think that one point that my organisation, Socialist Alternative, is pretty clear on is we don't want any nuclear power at all. We think nuclear power is a um, danger to the people who work um, in the nuclear power plants. Um, we think it's um, dangerous for the future of all civilization. Um, and we also think that it is in no way a solution to the environmental crises. It costs a lot of money to set up nuclear power plants. Uh, it takes decades to do it. Um, and we don't think that it would be an answer um, to the problems um, facing us. Someone asked about some of the debates um, about um, the environmental question. Um, my organisation says that we need to shut down the fossil fuel industry and replace it with renewable energy. And when we say fossil fuel, um, we mean we don't want coal-fired power plants. We don't want gas um, power plants. We want things like solar, um, wind, um, and the like. Some people on the left um, in Australia argue against shutting down the fossil fuel industry on the basis um, of it um, affecting workers in the coal industry. Um, we argue that they could be retrained um, into energy, um, into renewable energy industries. 
um, the crisis that fossil fuels bring um, onto us um, is something that needs to be strongly opposed. And this means shutting down um, dirty industries. And in Australia, you know, we see the effects of the, the climate crisis. Um, there have been multiple once in a hundred year flood events that have seen, seen um, whole communities um, underwater. We've had huge um, bushfires that have burnt hundreds of thousands of acres of land. Um, a million animals have been killed and um, many human lives have been lost. Um, and out of all of the issues in Australia, this is one of the issues that um, young people um, and, you know, people in general are really concerned about. And a majority of people in a majority of electorates in Australia um, are supportive of shutting down the fossil fuel industry and replacing it with renewable um, energy. Um, and so, yeah, I think for the left, we have to be opposed to nuclear power. We have to be opposed to new uranium mines. We have to be involved in the struggles um, alongside Indigenous people to stop uranium um, uh, nuclear waste dumps. Um, and we need to be strongly in favour of, um, yeah, to shutting down the fossil fuel industry, replacing it with renewable energy. Um, and I helped organise uh, protests in 2019 when the bushfire pro uh, the bushfires were happening. Um, we got 60,000 people in um, Sydney um, and 30,000 in Melbourne. That's sort of two major cities in Australia. I think the comrades in Argentina organised a protest out the front of the Australian embassy, um, as I remember it. So thank you, comrades. <laughs> Um, and, you know, this is the type of international solidarity that we need to have. Um, and, yeah, thanks, comrades. Thank you, Anek. So we've reached the end of this panel. It's very interesting. I think it leaves various debates open. I think many of some of these debates will repeat in the other panels because what we're discussing in the hands of capitalists, everything they touch is a danger to all of society because they are driven by profits, not social needs. So today there's no possibility of controlling any of their activities. Y a su vez necesitamos discutir los socialistas cómo sería la transición poscapitalista hacia el socialismo. Y ahí es donde entran distintos debates que tenemos que hacer que es por ejemplo la compañía de Australia plantea muy bien, allí no hay energía nuclear y evidentemente en Australia explains very well there is no nuclear energy there so their priority is keeping that from starting there are countries where it already exists in argentina we have nuclear plants so part of our energy grid it depends on that nuclear energy so part of our discussion has to be how to replace that and we have debates with others on the left who say with workers control everything is resolved and we say there is some activities that have to be eliminated that they are not controllable even today and from there we have to think plan propose a transition that can be sustainable and there are debates with workers that see their uh, their jobs endangered in eliminating uh, certain activities that you know socialists we have proposals for that for those workers to not lose their jobs but to relocalize them in other activities that are not 
contaminating. So we have to absolutely move from fossil-based energy for other activities, and that transition should include the workers of those energies. In relation to the center of the forum in the inter-imperialist struggles, this necessity that we talked about of uniting the debates of imperialist struggles and the environment. As, as imperialism is still the dominant system, wars will be on the horizon. They are taking us closer and closer to a possible third world war, which would absolutely be the last if we don't stop them before. Neither of the forces that are fighting to be hegemonic are progressive at all. And in the case of the Ukrainian war, and there is a debate over how, yeah, how do we end this war and related to the environmental consequences of uh, of that war. And the, the way to put an end to this is linked to the struggle to kick Russia out of Ukraine. And there is another set of debates in with some on the left that the war in Ukraine is part of an inter-imperialist struggle, but it combined with a struggle for self-determination in Ukraine. There are two processes that are combined in Ukraine. Well, we do have to be clear. There will be no possibility of the Ukrainian people or the whole region of peace or any possibility of prosperity if we don't put an end to that invasion. So I invite you to the rest of this event. In this link, the next panel will be about the debate over progressive progressives and extractivism. The center left uh, if the center left progressives are part of the extractivist model or not. As, as the right wing advances in some countries, in others, center left forces also advance. In Latin America, there's many governments like Chile's, Brazil's, Colombia's that are center left, want to discuss how they act in terms of extractivism. So we'll have panelists from Brazil, Chile, Argentina. So, and in this same link after that, we will have the closing a panel. The panel is called the Before It's Too Late, a debate over the post-capitalist transition to socialism. It's an important debate. We invite you to participate. You have the the times for all of these, which are different in every country. So, and in the other link, we have we have two links uh, simultaneous. The first panel and the other link is also ending now, which is with comrades of Asia and Africa and Middle East. The following panel in that link, there will be a debate over oil dependency, lithium, and false transitions. So we invite you all to take a break, and we'll see you in the in the next panel.
We've had to organize simultaneous panels, but they will all be posted on the ISL website. So 